Okay, uh, well, thank you. Uh, welcome uh, this morning. Today I want to give you my take on atomic dielectric resonance, or ADR, lighting away through the subsurface. And it's an independent review by my own company. I'm a consultant. But it's uh, utilising the technology of Adrock Limited, and they're based in Edinburgh. And uh, you know, many, many of you may know Gordon. He's uh, spoken here at this forum in the past, and that's how I first got involved uh, a couple of years ago. But let me introduce you to the technology. Um, I want to please grant me a bit of poetic licence today to talk of light um, as the whole EM spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, and not just the tiny little bit that we see with our, with our eyes. Now, the ADROC tools, they work mainly in uh, 1 to 100 uh, megahertz in the radio wave frequency, but they do go up to the radar uh, frequency as well. And what it's about is trying to penetrate the subsurface, and to do that, they uh, use directionality and coherence. And when we think about a street light in the fog, we get a bit of penetration, more or less in, in all directions. Um, but we get greater penetration when we focus the light using uh, reflective materials like we do in torches. Sorry, wrong button. And ADR uses a radio wave torch, pointing it into the subsurface, uh, achieving direct, uh, similar directionality. And while it's tempting to call these beams like lasers, um, in practice, beams in a strict sense have precise definitions, and the ADR scanning doesn't meet those precisely. But nevertheless, um, like lasers and LIDAR, the ADR scanner produces a coherent source, and this means that the source signals have the same waveform, the same frequency, and, the, uh, 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 and phase difference. And this character is what allows greater optical manipulation to achieve the directionality and shine this radio torch at, uh, at a specific part of the surface detecting... Uh, material contrast. But can light, you know, when we think of it in that sense, can it really penetrate deeply into solids, because that's the name of the game? I Personally, I find it helps to think of this flying a cathedral analogy, um, and this is an analogy for the atomic nucleus in an atom. And the point here is that even in solids, there's lots and lots of nothing. And the barriers to passage are really ones of force, not of physical stuff being there. And when light encounters a barrier, one of these three things happen. Reflection, transmission, or absorption. And how much of each depends on the wavelength and the frequency, the intensity, and the barrier itself. Its chemistry, its physical microstructure, and its thickness. And what that means is, um, while visible light, it doesn't travel through solids as easily because its wavelengths are of a size that interacts readily with, with the molecules and chemical structures. We look at gamma rays and X-rays, and they have more success at getting through solids because their wavelengths are too small to care. They, they're better at getting through the gaps. Radio waves have wavelengths that travel better through solids for a different reason. Their wavelengths are, are too large to care, and they're a bit like a cruise ship on a choppy sea. With enough push, they can sail on through. So a little bit of a history of ADR. Um, you know, I'm no expert. I'm new to this. I'm still learning. Um, but... The subsurface penetration of radar signals first turned up in, in, in 1910, and in the 1920s it was used to estimate depths of glaciers in the Alps. Um, but the advent of ground penetrating radar didn't come around until the 70s. But it wasn't until the 80s and the 90s that there were a series of military and space experiments, some including the shuttle, um, with aircraft and spacecraft, uh, and the name of the game was moving directed radar pulses uh, over an area. And they call that SAR. Um, and it gave the proof of concept for detection of shallow subsurface geology using this method with some successes in Scotland and the North Sea and Egypt. Um, and with the development of LiDAR technologies, uh, it was recognised that um, maybe similar approaches might be applicable to radio waves. And so this is when Colin Stove, he, he founded uh, ADR. He has a long history, <laughs> fun guy to talk to. Um, but he used his experience in SAR and GPR and remote sensing to found ADROC in 1994. Um, and since that time, ADROC have been applying this technology, trying to get it to go deeper. Um, and they've issued multiple patents since that time, I think about 25 or something like that. Um, and they've applied this technology in a variety of different fields. It's not just for geology, medicine, mining, hydrogeology, archaeology, hydrocarbons, and geothermal. And notably, one of the largest clients keep coming keeps coming back for more, the Chevron, um, and they're using the technique to assist with tracking injection fluids in North America. But today, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about a 2016-2017 Innovate project that looked at a bit of onshore UK petroleum geology. 
Before I do that, though, I just want to talk a little bit, bit about um, the theory. The, the absorption is an interesting thing to us uh, because it gives us a window into this thing called uh, the relative permittivity. And thinking about absorption, if we pour water onto a material, it's absorbed in different ways by different materials. And pouring light or electromagnetic radiation on, onto a material, it also creates different absorption responses. And ADR exploits this material specific um, response, and different types of uh, radio and radar have resonance properties that help facilitate the technique. And any subsurface reflections from the scanner's pulses are recorded in time, collated, and spectrally analysed for energy, frequency, and phase. And then Maxwell's equations are applied and a variety of different polarisation models, and that allows really three key variables to, 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 come, to be extracted, but the one that we're most interested in as, a ge as geologists uh, is the relative permittivity, or, or this dielectric constant, as it's sometimes known. So what is that? Um, well, it's defined relative to a, a vacuum, and it's set as one, and it's related to the electric susceptibility of a material, um, how polarised a dielectric material becomes in an applied electric field. And there's a variety, a variety of rocks share similar values, um, but the thing we need to note is that water, this is a log scale, by the way, water is up here at 81, Hydrocarbon is typically around 1 or 2, and most rocks in the, in the bracket 4 to 12. And what that means, as this chart shows here, uh, is that the tool should therefore be sensitive to porosity and water saturation. The devil is in the detail of discerning mixtures of rock types, porosity and pore fluids, because non-uniqueness uh, is the enemy here. And that requires a bit of creativity to bring in other calibrating information. And it hasn't been trivial, you know, trivial to do this. Um, but what isn't uh, ADR? Uh, is it like GPR? Well, uh, it has some similarities. It's a time domain electromagnetic method, but that's a big bucket. It has, has some similarities with seismic as well. Um, the observations are made at a variety of distances from the transmitter, and these two uh, deliver two NMO and ray tracing derived dielectric constant curves as a function of depth. And the, and the electromagnetic velocities are actually related to the dielectric constant, so these can be used to convert time to depth. But it's not GPR, um, although they both use <coughs> radio waves. GPR's higher frequencies and centimetre scale wavelength don't penetrate as deeply, and so it's really useful for the shallow subsurface. ADR uses different wavelengths to try and get things deeper. And GPR doesn't, also doesn't use the resident element of a wave packet to look at the material, and it's not normally uh, 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 involved in trying to discern the relative permittivity, this dielectric constant. So it's not that, and, and unlike seismic and GPR, ADR is not waving the energy about everywhere. It's trying to focus it in, a, in an intense ray, typically up to about 0.4 metres wide, and, but actually uh, a little uh, about 10 centimetres wide at its most intense. And as far as we can tell, it's not uh, significantly affected by structural dip. How about CS um, controlled source electromagnetic methods and magnetotelurics? We've heard a lot about these, these already this morning. And these are very useful, but they're techniques that uh, in, employ lower frequencies that don't see high detail. And they're measuring changes by externally sourced electromagnetic fields, either natural or controlled. And they happen relatively slowly compared to what the ADAR tool does instantly. And so while these other EM methods have a very important and useful place, we've seen that already, um, ADR is fundamentally different. Uh, you know, it's endeavouring to give a metre scale resolution at kilometre scale depths using these directional radio, wave, uh, uh, radio waves to illuminate and their resonance properties as well. And that's the name of the game is to highlight the dielectric permittivity and other contrasts in the subsurface. And I just want to emphasise today, I mean, you, you, it's not really a question of whether this works. We know it does. It's about how deep can it work. This is an image of a horse buried in concrete in, in, in a viaduct in Scotland. It's a long story, it's on the AdRock website, it's worth having a look. But these are the AdRock tools, and they're seeing this image through several metres of concrete, so we know it works on that scale. AdRock have taken the tools down a mine in the northwest US, and they've been able to detect their own signals through hundreds of metres of rocks. So we know it works on that scale. It works on several metres, it works on hundreds of metres, so the question we're trying to tackle uh, of interest to me, anyway, is can we take it to the kilometre scale level, uh, including petroliferous sedimentary basins? And, you know, our are employing a number of different techniques to do that. We've already seen the lower the frequency, the greater the penetration. 
Um, you get conductive losses in soil where there's a lot of water with free ions. That's a limiting factor. So if you can steer away from those, you can see deeper. And that's also why onshore is the focus of this talk. And Adrock also focused their attention on the head of the wave because this is where the least energy is lost and where the, the, the form is best preserved. And electromagnetic waves are combining different frequencies and they form directed packets of energy in a fixed pulse with a fixed phase relationship. And unlike lasers, which we've got here, which are one colour, uh, it's multispectral. It's multicoloured in the radio wave domain to capture more response. And because of that, it's, because it's coherent and multispectral, the loss of energy to the surroundings is min minimised by dispersion. I'm not the physicist here, so if you have detailed questions about this, you need to chat to Adrock. But um, the scanner applies two synchronised waves that work together in phase, uh, and they're transmitted in shared focus rays, uh, and they eliminate the surface here in a, a narrow downward converging cone. And the pulses really have two components. They have this longer wavelength standing wave that helps to go deep, and they have these shorter resonant waves within it to enhance the vertical resolution. It's not just used in hydrocarbons. Uh, it's been used with some success in high, uh, iron sulphide deposits in Australia. Here you can see there's a nice spike in the energy response, and that correlates to um, iron sulphides cal calibrated with core. And again, in another uh, ore body, a different location, again in Australia, there's a frequency response which is helping to delineate the, uh, the, the sulphide body at depth. It's also used in geothermal. Um, the... Uh, not only does it help you to detect the reservoir, um, the dielectric constant is a function of temperature, uh, and that can mean that steam can be highlighted in the dielectric curve as well. Um, and this is an example where some steam is showing up as peaks on, on a dielectric curve uh, from a geothermal well in New Zealand. And the ADRA aren't the only people using this kind of technology, the radar to see deep. Um, uh, you might have heard over Christmas uh, that ESA's uh, Mars Express probe uh, detected a, a, a liquid lake underneath the, the Martian South Polar ice cap, and that's what it looks like. This is deep radar at 1.5 kilometres depth, showing a what they interpret as a liquid water lake underneath I uh, layers of, of ice and dust. So this is, uh, technology is a real one. Uh, it's increasingly used. Uh, Adrox taking it to new places uh, with specifically engineered uh, techniques for deep subsurface resource exploration undertaken remotely from the ground surface. So for me as a geologist, it was simply to see, is, is this working? Is it for real? Um, but, but the tool itself is backpack portable. Um, you can take it to remote locations and difficult terrain. You can get into urban and industrial environments with negligible impact. Um, you can do layer calibration of samples, no problem. And the surveys are effectively 1D, uh, but um, you can do sections of a few hundred metres from the sites, uh, taking it into the realms of 1.5D and 2, 2D in a standard project. The, the duration of the field work is con typically completed in a few weeks, and the processing uh, is really the, the most uh, time-consuming process. It takes a, a few months. The cost is a fraction of wells and seismic units, I say, and while it won't, my sense is it won't totally replace them, but the goal here is to help place them more efficiently. Um, but, you know, it's another arrow in the de-risking quiver. And it's just, can't stress enough, that this is all remote sensing done from the surface. You don't need a new hole to do this. So moving on to the uh, case study in question, I was asked by ADROC uh, to review the results as part of an Innovate UK project um, for a client in, involved in UK onshore basins, three of them. Um, and I was invited as a geologist to suggest some workflow improvements. And, I, and so I have done. I won't go into this in detail, but uh, I have. Um, and, but my approach has really been a non-theoretical, empirical one, wearing a, a geologist hat. Um, that, is this tool responding to geology? Uh, yes or no? Does it do what it says on the tin? And if yes, can it, does it do so reliably enough to faci facilitate use in a predictive context? I should add we've had physical assistance from David Sandra, um, and, uh, <clears throat> but really, uh, my role here is uh, I've been trying to see objectivity, auditability, and repeatability, and that involves using maths as well as just your eyes. I think some of the previous work that had gone on that was very quite subjective and qualitative. I was been trying to move it more into a mathematical arena, and that's so that clients themselves can ver verify and check 
and give an honest appraisal, uh, warts and all, uh, of this technology. So what data is recorded? Um, well, for this particular project, we focused on 17 different curves. Now, there are many thousands of repeated measurements taken to increase the signal-to-noise ratio, up to 100,000. Um, and as you can imagine, the electromagnetic uh, arena is not a noise-free one, so that's necessary. And, this, the, and the processing looks at 1.5 metre intervals, uh, <coughs> plus or minus 1.5 metre intervals. And I'm not going to go into all the curves in detail, but what you need to know is that there's 14 curves related to various aspects of energy and frequency, this includes the reflectivity, and it includes statistic statistical analysis of uh, these measurements. Um, there's two curves that are directly related to the dielectric constant, uh, independently estimating that. And there's one curve that looks at the number of harmonics present in the resident frequency response. But the problem is, uh, you know, any individual parameter from those 17 curves will vary according to composition and lithology. And you can see that here from energy, frequency, and dielectric constant. All these values are differing by lithology. But one parameter alone won't always be an, uh, unique enough to unambiguously identify a lithology. They share these values sometimes. So what we need to do is use curve combinations to help build uniqueness and to use local well calibration and stratigraphic knowledge to help with that. Um, and this is kind of uh, uh, almost a health warning just by way uh, of managing your expectations. This is what the data looks like, and it's not like gamma ray. You know, you're not going to look at this curve and instantly, at a glance, understand where things are. Um, there are some curves more than others that hold a, a more direct relation to the lithology, but the interpretation and the analysis takes a detailed look at all the log responses uh, in calibration of the local info. But it is relatively uh, easy to do this calibration if you have a historical well somewhere or the tool can be taken very close or right on to a historical well site and the data required. Um, and you can compare it with uh, historical uh, well logs such as you have here and you can do some petrophysics um, uh, such as they allow. And uh, then you can bring your ADR tool and, uh, and uh, the, uh, acquire the data. But it's one of the things that has happened in the past is... Uh, uh, is calibration based on the interpreted uh, lithology uh, alone. And one thing I stress is it's important to base calibration on the continuously varying log and petrophysical curves and not just to the discrete interpreted lithology because nature just isn't like that. You know, it's gradational and the tool is seeing more than that, I believe. <coughs> but we already know uh, the theoretical ranges of the dielectric constant for various minerals and fluids. Uh, there are lots of lab experiments and published literature and what that does is allow us uh, to model the dielectric constant of a lithological mixture from the calibrating well petrophysics um, according to a set of defined rules and assumptions. Now, this isn't trivial. It's, it's still an uh, evolving process. But what it can do is serve to highlight the main contrast we're likely to see. And we can do this all ahead of and independently of any ADR data acquisition. Um, and what that allows us to do is some pre-acquisition feasibility and also some post-acquisition quality control. And the early results um, are suggesting that this forward modelling does have some success in replicating the gross form of the uh, dielectric constant. It's not exact, and we wouldn't expect it to be, but um, there's two areas down here where we seem to be getting some replication in form. Um, <clears throat> and if we get a decent match, it's giving us an independent verification that the tool is seeing real stuff at depth. And if the match is sufficiently decent, it might even give an opportunity for independent uh, depth error verification because there's a depth conversion error when we convert to that. But sometimes, you know, things are just different. We're not trying to hide that, or much more dramatic from, than uh, the modelled dielectric constant. So understanding this better, it's still a work in process. Um, we're not too stressed by that. You know, it's early days. But we're seeing sufficient en encouragement here to develop the workflows further. And one thing we can also do is forward model the effect of hydrocarbon saturation. Um, uh, with reservoir fluid substitution. So we, uh, with a reservoir flag, you can then fill it with the hydrocarbons and, imagine, uh, and see what uh, the modelling uh, would predict. And uh, so this is the reservoir flag, 100% sa uh, water saturation and 85% uh, oil saturation, and you can see the difference that you would expect. <clears throat> 
Now, from empirical calibration with lithology, we can design very simple mathematical uh, operations. Uh, we, we can design combinations of these curves to accentuate observed responses, and I call these lithometrics. Now, these aren't diagnostic, they're just a guide, but this shows one of them. You can also see a standard deviation in, a, in an average version of it, um, and this shows the peaks and troughs present in that curve. And you compare that with the log data, and the good news um, is that many, uh, not all, uh, peaks and trough responses uh, can coincide with uh, geologic, geological contrast. We have to be aware of spurious correlation, uh, of course, that's a real danger here. But we're getting encouragements that uh, this is seeing real geological contrast. The bad news is there's not always going to be a systematic relationship to plane lithology here. It's much more complex. Uh, and that's no surprise because, remember, we're looking at atomic level responses here. And we're looking at chemistry, microstructure, thickness of the barriers. And that means that we need a lo a local calibration to the stratigraphy, and it means that it's good to have a number of different metrics, and, and we do, and, there's, uh, and we can't use about seven. But there's no reason why we can't use more. Um, but the point is that sometimes it's physiology. I'd, I'd be lying if I said there, were, there weren't times when it doesn't work as well, but we see that it can work. This shows you an anhydrite layer. Uh, layer. This is the petrophysics here. Uh, we've got an anhydrite layer. We've got um, a sandstone, and we've got some carbonate as well. And we're getting a big peak uh, in this lith 5 metric at a strong anhydrite limestone uh, sandstone porous perm contrast. And this is about kilometre depth. But notice also that where the petrophysics is giving us these carbonate bands, we're seeing these quite distinctive little triangular wedges. I call them carbonate ledges that coincide with them. And note also here the lack of appreciable depth area. Uh, error. This is, you know, more or less spot on, this response. So to me, this is interesting as a geologist. Seeing the hydrocarbons, well, that's perhaps a little bit harder. We would expect a negative deflection uh, in the dielectric constant value. But this might not be a, of an amplitude that's very different from geological variations. But if we know we're in the reservoir vicinity from other calibrating information, it might be enough to infer hydrocarbon presence. And here we have the petrophysics of the well... Uh, we've got some more saturations down here, and this is the dielectric constant that's been acquired. And what we can see is we've got a nice negative deflection here due to the hydrocarbon presence in this thin sandstone. There are some, the petrophysics was uh, bringing out some more subtle saturations, and you can imagine perhaps there's deflections associated with those. But then we also get this big deflection. Is that real? You know, so it's never cut and dry, but, and it brings me on to the next subject, you know, Sometimes we do get blips that are just hard to explain. So we've got a model here, but we've got two big blips here that just happen to roughly coincide with two hydrocarbon-bearing reservoirs in the area. Is that coincidence? Um, you know, the fact that it's higher dielectric constants would lead us to expect there's more water than expected. Could it be production related to a waterfront migration between log acquisition and the eight-hour acquisition? Um, dis discussions with the operator seem to rule that out. One other option is that maybe we have a bit of depth conversion error here, um, may, perhaps because the ADR acquisition was a bit offset from the well and there's a bit of dip. But even so, even if we do that and correct by 25 metres, we still get uh, some of the blips being anomalous and you know, the, the modelling is not... Um, what, I, what I should stress is that sometimes when you do this modelling, it overemphasises the effect of prosty. So that's still something we, we think about. If there's a lot of water there, it seems to, the modelling seems to overemphasise it. So we're still dealing with the, these issues. And some things just can't be answered on a small database yet in a structurally and methodologically complex area. So we're still at a very early point of the learning curve, similar, I guess, to the early days of wildline logging. Well, but we don't need to fully understand a geophysical response to use it empirically for calibration as long as it's consistent. You know, the understanding helps, but it can come second, like seismic. We don't need to know why we have a response to map it. And this is a you know, horrible slide, perhaps, but what we have here is all the ADR curves lined up. And what I've done, if you have a pair of wells where you have calibrating information, the geology and the, the lithostratigraphy, you can log the character response, uh, troughs, peaks, uh, uh, other, various other things, for each of those curves, you can create what I call an ADR lithostratigraphic genome. And that's what we're showing here. If you just remove all the curves out and just leave the character. And these curves you can do for each well, but they represent the kind of calibration between a well pair. 
And the beauty of that is that it provides a reference framework that you can then apply to new sites. So we're marrying the ADR data to the lithostratigraphy. And for now, you know, this is obviously quite qualitative and subjective, but perhaps in the future there are ways of ma making it more mathematical. Artificial intelligence springs to mind. Um, that's things, something we're working on. But if you have this framework, you can apply it to a new well, um, and you can, that can help an anchor it in the local stratigraphy, allowing you to make a prediction of what that stratigraphy is. And then you can bring in the dielectric constant from the ADR data, and you can use it to make... Uh, predictions about the hydrocarbons in, in, in the reservoirs. And that's assisted by the forward dielectric modelling and the fluid substitutions. And then, of course, if you have the actual data, you can uh, marry it against that uh, and see if it works. And we've had uh, some success at these, at these levels, uh, thanks to the petrophysics of David, David Singh. But, um, so what are the case study implications? Well, I'd argue that the subsurface geology has been seen by the architect. ADR techniques uh, at these depths, but not all subsurface geology is. And the de detection seems to work best where there are strong pore permanent fluid saturation contrasts. It readily sees the high water content. Purely lithological changes, they're, they're sometimes discernible too, but in a purely sedimentary basin context, uh, these are typically non unique and they can require careful calibration to progress. Um, the forward modelling of the relative permittivity, the dielectric constant, that helps give you advanced indication of what should be detected, and that can uh, help us, uh, place these ADR results in the stratigraphy. Detecting the hydrocarbons uh, is a bit trickier, but it's also feasible, and the higher the saturation, the easier that should be. Where we have complex or poorly calibrated geology, where we have a lot of stratigraphic variability, where we have low hydrocarbon saturations, where we have old and sparse calibrating logs, these aren't showstoppers, but they will hamper the interpretation. And where I think this tool has a future uh, uh, for now is really in simpler situations where there's less, less structural and lithological variability. Uh, uh, and that's going to be most helpful for, for ongoing verification in a, in a petroleum context. So lastly, what I, what, something of the future. The, there are advances happening in data processing. You know, most of the big logging houses these days have their own downhole dielectric tools. That's going to help with calibration. Adrock are designing their own. Um, <clears throat> and it will also help understand the detail of the signal <coughs> propagation in porous rocks by being able to compare the distal and the rem uh, remote sensing versions of this uh, tool. Chem scanning, I think that might help with uh, understanding the dielectric detail of rock mixtures further, again helping in the calibration. And uh, artificial intelligence, deep machine learning, um, this is essentially a problem that we're facing of pattern recognition from multiple data sets and theoretical constraints, we have a lot of those, and so that, at first glance, seems a good problem for our artificial intelligence techniques. Applying learnings, well, production and enhanced oil recovery, monitoring waterfront propagations due to production and injection, that seems a bit of a no-brainer, and that's what Chevron is using it for in North America. Um, I think using this tool on shore where the lith lithological variations are limited so that we can better see the effects of fluid saturation I think that will help too. And the things that spring to mind are deltaic and turbididic environments. You just have sand shale, or perhaps the marine uh, carbonate shale sequences of the Middle East, or perhaps um, if we're looking for the contrast at the base of evaporites, maybe in onshore fold and thrust belt. You know, it helps to work where we have a good density of calibrating well information, but where is that not true of the onshore today? And, you know, we want you know, to use this tool, we want targets to have a significant thickness and a strong pore or perm contrast, but that's what we're looking for anyway. The tool comes to it, into its own where access via other techniques is limited. Um, in urban, industrial, remote, rugged environments, here the value of information that's provided, provided by the tool potentially is increased. And uh, also where we have hard rock mineralisation. You know, in those lithologically drier environments, perhaps... The, the response due to exotic minerals uh, uh, like sulphides is, can be more prominent. So, closing comments. This is a young technology. Nobody's pretending otherwise. It's under development and nobody is uh, saying everything is understood. You know, the physics here is involved. Um, and the non-uniqueness of subsurface responses can be an issue, and it doesn't see everything. You know, we need a strong dielectric contrast. But at the end of the day, this is a backpack portable surface tool seeing some geological contrasts uh, to verifiable depths of uh, two kilometres. 
probably more. It's just, I'm saying two kilometers because that's how far the wells went. And, and apparently with meter scale resolution. And if that doesn't prick our ears up a little bit as geoscientists, I suspect maybe we're not thinking about it hard enough. Um, with calibration, we're getting better at predicting in advance the contrast it should see. And, you know, it's not going to replace onshore seismic or drilling totally, let's be real, but it can help place those things more sensibly in certain environments. So it's a new cost-saving technology in the de-risking arsenal, especially where these things, terrain, infrastructure, or population density, hinder things like seismic. You can apply it for almost any subsurface resource, and so it seems to, the time seems right to, to apply it more widely and increase understanding of the tool. Does it work everywhere? All the time? No, it doesn't. Is it perfected now? No. Is EM noise a challenge? Yes. And does it still puzzle us? Yes. I've had, I've had moments where I've banged my head against the wall trying to understand it. But there are eureka moments as well where you can see it's working. And where mankind sees that something does work, you know, as a species we have a good track record of refining it and bettering it in our service. And I think that's what Adrock is trying to do. And I think it helps to think about you know, where the first wire line was 100 years ago. You know, perhaps the scope here uh, for advance is comparable. And, and you know, there's no guarantees of that. But you know, I've seen enough to think it's worth finding out. And we don't bite. OK. <laughs> Hello, thanks for your talk. Christian Richards, Austin Bridgeforth. Uh, yeah, just noticed on some of the response curves you showed up there, um, you seem to able to maintain resolution with increasing depth. Just struggling to get my head around that. Apologies if I missed an explanation, but could you elaborate on that, please? Well, I think, you know, like, like I said, I'm not the physicist here, I'm the geologist. My approach has been with a geological hat on. What is the data? Uh, where are the blips? Does it respond to geology? In a crude sense, that's what I've been doing. So if you... Uh, uh, apologies, but if you want to go into the, the detailed physics of the responses and how that works, adapts, you need to chat to the ad rock guys. Sure, okay. Okay. Um, I guess uh, in the same way in which we use hyperspectral imagery, we're able to uh, tune the wavelengths we want to detect. Um, I picked up on the fact that you said it's proce the processing is quite intensive. Can you tune... Uh, the signals that you're searching for there? I'm thinking in terms of mining uh, an enriched zone, for example, you know what response you expected to get. Well, I think so, yeah. I think the guys, uh, you know, obviously you're not going to use the same thing for, for looking at a horse in a viaduct as you are for something that's, uh, you know, chasing hydrocarbons deep. So, yeah, the guys, are, I think, will vary it, you know, according to what they're looking for. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I know you two guys are bridging on. Tim Archer from Reed Geophysics. Um, you're claiming a, 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 a meter scale resolution at two kilometers depth, uh, and on one of the early slides, um, I noticed that the, the main bandwidths are uh, one megahertz up to 100. Um, conventional physics dictates that uh, with those wavelengths, you're getting a resolution at the low frequency end of, of about 100 meters. That's the kind of feature that you, you'd be able to image, the, the thickness of feature. Now, obviously, as you increase the frequency, uh, you're going to be able to image smaller features, but then your penetration depth drops off. Mm -hmm. So at the top end of your frequencies, you're going to get a maximum 10, uh, 10 meter penetration. Mm. Um, you, you, you just, I mean, this is not, not my idea. Um, I, uh, although I'm mostly grav mag now, I spent seven years with Anglo-American um, flying an airborne electromagnetic system. Oh, yeah, I know, Tim. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I sort of ad-rocked would be about you in advance. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's not uh, just me. Most of the no, I know, mainstream no, 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 look, scientific look. community has serious reservations. No, I know. Look, 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 can, I, can I just stop you there and just yeah. say, yes, we, I realise that. You know, look, look, I can't understand everything, but my approach, let me just explain to you what my, t t I, I hear what you're saying, and I don't think you're wrong, but uh, what I am aware of is that they're looking at a whole lot, lot of different things. Not, and it's simply, if you look at it 
what is it saying? This is my job. You know, this is, this is okay. It almost isn't, for me, it's been a case of, I'm not trying to understand the physics too much, and I defer to people like yourselves that understand a lot more. But I'm standing back empirically as a geologist and saying, these are the curves they're giving me, and this is what's coming out. Too simple, uh, I manipulate them sometimes to normalise them, to add, subtract, multiply, divide. That's what I do. And I see what comes out. And I'm seeing responses that are, lar that are large that match uh, a geological horizon at that depth. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to under understand why that happens. That's for other people to argue about. But what I'm saying is it does seem to be happening. Not all the time, but when you have that anhydrite layer and you have that ping coming in like that, um, it's just compelling. I, don't, I can't explain to you why that's happening. I'm, I, I don't have the physics to do that. But I'm saying as a geologist that it looks like it is happening. And, you know, I've had days when I thought, OK, is this all for real or is this just made up? But then you, you go through this forward di dielectric modelling response exercise and you just kind of plug in the numbers and, you know, I'm doing it very simply. There are better ways to do it. But just going through that exercise and you can, in, in certain locations you come out with a contrast that mirrors what the tool is doing. To me, that says, OK, I might not understand why this is happening, but that, uh, for me, is compelling. And I'm not, I'm not, no, nobody's pretending that happens all the time everywhere, but to me it seems like there are places where it's too, too, the match is too good to be chance. Um, you know, and obviously there the probably needs to be more statistical testing of that by others who, who know statistics. But I'm just highlighting the fact, that, as a geologist, that yes, there are issues, uh, we hear you, uh, you know, it's not always going to work, but and yet, that is what I'm trying to say to you today. And yet, somehow, as as a, a geophysicist, I've always got to be careful of confirmation bias in my of own course, work, yeah, yeah. particularly when I get excited about a technology. Mm -hmm. um, and when that happens with a technology that I don't understand, yeah. then I get quite concerned. Well, well, I know, you, you know, I mean, I, I'm with you. I, the, the, the problem is there's quite a lot to understand uh, and this stuff, uh, and I've been trying hard to do that. You know, I started off with this, you know, as a geologist, and since then I've been trying to go in and understand it in more detail. And I, I hear what you're saying, and the worry is, is, is always if it's just once, then, then fine, you worry about it, maybe it's just something spurious. And so that's where you need to go away and, and, and do it. But the fact is that Chevron, you know, they're not stupid. They've been doing this for, for years and they've just renewed a contract with Adrock, coming back. And, and that's where I think it has value. If you're doing it again and again, applying it in an area you know well and getting to understand what it does respond to, and it maybe that it's not, you know, um, whether it's metre scale or not, the fact is, you know, maybe it's 10 metre scale. I mean, I think actually this, some of the depth conversion errors I've been seeing coming out are a bit more, uh, you know, the more on the, on, on the 10, 20 metre uh, uh, scale sometimes, so perhaps you know maybe they're just lucky sometimes with that meter correspondence. But is it seeing stuff at depth? I think it is. Um, Obviously, geologically, looking at wireline, which we're all now fairly familiar with, um, the big distinction there is you're going down to the source of the action. Uh -huh. um, so you're seeing that fine detail, um, literally in the wall rock or very close. I, I, I just can't accept that you're getting that detail of resolution from a, a sensor a kilometre well, or more hear above you. you know, and we, you know, I mean, like I say, uh, hear you, uh, and I think it's a conversation that needs to happen and more. But I just, uh, you know, I'm just aware that sometimes we're too quick to dismiss things because we don't understand them. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, at the end of the day we do have to understand them, but maybe there's more of a conversation there. And I think the, the, the evolution of these downhole calibrating tools will be helpful because there we can see, we can do what you want to do and get close and see what the dielectric response is. And then we can really test in a lot more detail, you know, is, are we seeing from the surface what has been seen downhole? And we can understand more about how that signal is, is mirroring what's seen downhole or not, you know. And so I think, uh, you know, as I said at the end of my talk, I think this is worth chasing further. That's my flag at the end of, you know, two years of looking at this stuff. <coughs> Do I understand everything? Do I realise there are issues, as you've identified? Yes. Yeah. But I think it's worth chasing some more. We, we'd welcome that conversation, and preferably through peer-reviewed scientific literature. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, John, John Glass from, from, from Cloverfield. 
Um, I was struck that uh, this technique might be useful in semi-arid areas where agriculture depends on irrigation uh, for mapping the water table um, and changing salinity in the subsurface water. Mm. Um, have there been any case studies where, where this technique's been used for that? Um, yep. Um, there's, a, there's a variety, of, you know, if you go to the ADRAC website, there's a variety of case studies. And, you know, I think, you know, these are the more traditional uses of a tool like, you know, ground, ground penetrating radar on it. Uh, you know, the, the, to see the water, I think one, one thing uh, it is useful at seeing is seeing the water. Uh, and they have used it in a hydrogeological context. Uh, context. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, 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 the hydro, you know, the petroleum geology aspect of it is taking it to another level, but there are a whole lot of other uses that's been useful. Okay, one more, and then we'll stop at the coffee, please. Right at the back, oh, you need to rush. Hi, uh, Rob Jones, uh, Heritage. Have you tried uh, consistency? Does it produce the same result if you survey the same point Say a few months later, or even on a few days later. Yeah, it has been has been tried. Yep, and uh, there's some similarities. Suffice to say, it's not uh, exact. You know, we are in a it, uh, are in a yeah, noisy world, uh, but yes, there has been tried, and uh, uh, there is some consistency achieved. I, I don't have the slides, but I can pass it on to you. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, David. Thank you.